We want to talk about antiderivatives and integrals, and we can probably conceptualize what is meant by an antiderivative. It's like starting with the derivative and then moving backwards and asking what was the original function that gave us this derivative. So for instance, if f prime of x equals x, what is the original function f of x? So then we have to use a little bit of thought and say, okay, well, it's probably something like x squared, right? Because when we take the derivative of that, the, the squared comes down and we prime that out, okay. But that gives us two x, so we're close. How about, what if we tried x squared over two? Okay, take the derivative of that, the two comes down, and then we have the two in the denominator, x, those twos cancel, leaving us with x. So if the derivative of this function equals x, we've determined that the original function must be x squared over two. f of x must be x squared over two. Okay, similarly, what if our derivative was x squared? What would the original function have been? So we're looking at some function such that when we take the derivative of it, we get x squared. Well, I'm thinking it must be something like x cubed, because then we use the power rule when we take the derivative, and we get x squared. But when we use the power rule, that 3 will come down, so let's put a divide by 3 to cancel it out. Now we should all agree that the derivative of x cubed over 3 is indeed x squared. Check. So then we'd say that the original function here is f of x equals x cubed over 3. But we're missing one thing on both of these solutions here. Because when we go back to take the derivative of these, yes, we would get our original derivatives as desired, but we're missing a constant. So I'm going to say plus c on both of these. Why would I do that? Well, because when I take the derivative of these, that constant just goes away, right? Because the derivative of a constant is zero. So to give the most general answer, we always have to tack on a plus c when we're doing this kind of antiderivative to say, yeah, this could be x squared over two plus 10 or plus 15 or plus 1500. When we take the derivative, no matter what that term is, it automatically drops out because the derivative of a constant is zero. So always add a plus c when you're taking antiderivatives like this. So before we move on, I want to stop for a minute and look at what we've discovered. We've discovered something so fundamental, and I even hesitate to call it an antiderivative because that makes it seem like it's a result of a derivative, when in many ways this thing we've discovered, this essentially a backwards derivative, is more fundamental to mathematics than the derivative itself. And this thing we've discovered is called the integral. So we can now say that the integral of x... Okay, so the integral is a way of saying the antiderivative. dx, so that's just telling us, this dx just tells us what we're taking the, the integral with respect to. It gives us a little more information about what we're integrating with respect to. That'll make more sense when we have um, different variables. That comes in Calc 3. But we've decided that this integral, this antiderivative, is x squared over 2 plus c. All right, and this S looking symbol, it's not quite an S, it's like an S that got stretched out, and there's a good reason for that, and we'll talk about that later. But that symbol combined with the stuff inside it is called the integral. And we'll spend roughly a third to a little over a third of the course studying this. So Calc 1 is usually about two thirds derivatives and one third integration. And then Calc 2, I would say, is maybe two thirds integration and one third other stuff. So it's super central to what we want to get out of the course, right? For our second one here, we could say, okay, the integral of x squared dx. Well, we decided that that is indeed x cubed over three plus c. Now there's a rule to be discovered here. So when we had x in the integral, we'd say x is the integrand, by the way, we'll talk more about that later as well. When we take the integral of it or the antiderivative, it, it goes to x squared over two. And then if we start with x squared, it goes to x cubed over 3. So if you had to guess, what do you think the integral of x cubed would be? x cubed dx? 
Well, indeed, it equals x to the fourth over four plus c. And this goes on and on. This is called the power rule for indefinite integrals, and it tells us that x to the p for any real number p, as long as it's not negative one, so it can't be negative one, but anything else, you add one to p, so we get x to the p plus one, and then divide by that quantity, so divide by p plus one, don't forget the c. What does the indefinite part mean? Well, don't worry too much about that. We'll talk about that in an upcoming section once we get the fundamental theorem of calculus and all that. And don't forget to add plus c. Anytime you evaluate an indefinite integral like this, you add plus c because when you take the derivative, that c just drops out. Okay, so you can imagine how this works. This works for any integral. Let's do, I don't know, x to the 20 dx. Well, of course, it is then x to the 21. You add one and then divide by whatever you have up there over 21. Plus c, don't forget that. All right, so it's pretty easy to use. Now that we're on a roll, let's get two more rules for integration. So we have the constant multiple rule, which tells us that a constant on the inside of the integral comes out to the outside of the integral and leaves the rest of the integral unaffected. So that c just pops right through that integral symbol out to the outside. So that constant multiple rule, just to be really, really clear, says the integral of c times f of x dx equals c times the integral of f of x dx. The sum rule is a way of splitting the integral up over two functions. And, when, and it says that when we have the integral of f plus g, well, that just gives us the integral of f of x dx plus the integral of g of x dx. Well, now, to get really technical real quick, this, these are both conditions for something to be linear, um, but I won't go too far into that. It's just these are really nice properties to have, right? If, if integrals didn't do this, we wouldn't spend nearly as much time studying them. But the fact that integrals have these two properties make them very interesting tools to work with. And if you continue in math, you will study them deeply. Let's try some examples. Okay, for the first one, we have the integral of the quantity 5 over t squared plus 4t squared plus 2 dt. First note that we can rewrite this to make it in a form that's slightly easier to take the integral of. I'm going to write this as 5t to the negative, t negative 2 plus 4t squared plus 2. All right, plus make that a 2 and then a dt. I was getting ahead of myself a little bit there, dt. Okay, well, remember the power rule for indefinite integrals says to add one and divide to these exponents. So this becomes 5t to the negative 2 plus 1 is negative 1 all over negative 1. Plus, okay, 4t squared. Add one and divide. So this becomes 4t cubed over 3. Okay, on to the next term. We have plus 2. Well, the integral of 2 is simply 2t, right? Anytime you have a constant by itself, you essentially tack on the variable. Why would I do that? Well, if I were to take the derivative of 2t, I would get 2 back. So the antiderivative of 2 is 2t. And that holds for any constant by itself here. Okay, well, don't forget our constant plus c, because if we went to take the derivative of this, that constant would drop off. So we'll put it there to give the most general answer possible. So really, we call this a family of solutions. Okay, let's clean this up a little bit. Maybe we can make this, say, uh, 4 thirds t cubed minus 5 over t plus, plus 2t, 2t plus c. There you go. It always helps put answers in a nice form if possible. Moving on to the second one, we have the integral of 5m times the quantity 12m cubed minus 10m. All that's dm with respect to m there. Well, we don't have any kind of product rule for integration. Really now or ever. We have something that kind of resembles a product rule, barely. But we don't have anything as overarching as a product rule that we had for derivatives. We don't have that coming. It doesn't exist. So derivatives was... A special case and we were kind of lucky because we had these rules that worked for any product we don't have that for integrals so what do we do well we get rid of the product for now so we have the integral of 60 m to the fourth 
minus 50 m squared dm. So dm, and I'll put these back in parentheses, and now we can more easily do this integral. We'll hit it with the power rule, so this is 60 m to the fifth, and then divide by 5 minus 50 m cubed, then we divide by 3 plus c, don't forget that constant. Well, we can simplify this a tiny bit. We could write this as, let's see, 60 divided by 5 is 12. So we have 12m to the fifth minus, how about if we write that as 50 thirds m cubed plus c. Now, you can always check that these are correct by going back and taking the derivatives of them. And I recommend doing that while you're getting used to using this notation and thinking in terms of antiderivatives. It's really easy to get tangled up on how the rules for antiderivatives are different from the rules for derivatives. So check to make sure your integral is correct by taking the derivative of it. Make sure you get the same thing back that you started with. Moving on to part C, we have the integral of the quantity x squared minus 36 all over the quantity x minus 6. Now we don't have any kind of quotient rule for integrals. That's another thing that we don't have for integrals that we did have for derivatives. So that makes integrals challenging. Is there anything else we can do here? Well, yes. Let's just do some old school factoring here. So this becomes the integral of x plus 6 up top times x minus 6. And then we get our cancellation divided by x minus 6 dx. And now we can do our cancellation, leaving us simply with the integral of the quantity x plus 6 dx. Much simpler. All right, let's go ahead and evaluate that. The integral of x is x squared over 2. So I added 1 and divided. Plus 6 becomes 6x. And don't forget our plus c. Okay, moving on to part d, we have the integral of the quantity cubed root of x squared plus the square root of x cubed dx. Pause the video, see if you can work this one out on your own. It's challenging, but I think you have the skills built up to do it from the examples we've seen. Try it out. Okay, let's work it together. The first thing I'm going to do is rewrite this. And you always should do this for integrals uh, until you're very good at working with them at least. I'm going to rewrite it as x to the 3 Make that to the two-thirds power. So remember that the top variable is the power. The bottom variable is the radical index. So x to the two-thirds plus x to the three over two, because square root is actually one-half power. So we have x cubed to the one-half, which gives us x to the three-halves. All of this is dx. Okay, well now we hit this with our power rule for integrals. So this becomes x to the two-thirds plus one over two-thirds plus one plus x to the three-halves plus one. I'm just evaluating it with the product rule over three-halves plus one. Don't forget the plus c. Okay, well, here we're going to need some common denominators. Nothing wrong with that. Let's do three over three. And on the other one, let's do two over two. So 3 over 3 down here and 2 over 2. Of course, it's all the same. So this now becomes x to the 2 thirds plus 3 thirds, which is x to the 5 thirds. So we have x to the 5 thirds over 5 thirds. Well, we can multiply by the reciprocal and write that as 3 fifths x to the 5 thirds. So let's do that. 3 fifths. And that's, that's going to be a common technique. When you're dividing by a fraction down here, uh, you very quickly will find yourself just multiplying by the reciprocal and calling it good, because it is good. Okay, plus on the second one, we have x to the 3 plus 2, so this becomes 5 halves over 5 halves. Don't forget your plus c. Let's clean the second term up a little bit. We wouldn't want to divide by 5 halves, but instead I'm going to flip it and multiply, so we have 2 fifths x to the 5 halves. Okay, two-fifths. Okay, so there's our final answer. Don't believe me? Well, take the derivative and see if you can get the same integrand back that we started with. That tells you that our integral is indeed valid and correct.